2021 has been one of the craziest years on record for the housing market, at least since I've been studying the housing market and been an active real estate investor. And one of the things I like to do in these types of markets where there really isn't any historical precedent is do a look back at some of the data from previous months or previous years and use the benefit of hindsight to explain what has happened. So that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna look at the five most important stories and headlines from 2021. We're gonna see what we can explain about them now that we have some hindsight, and we're gonna look forward to 2022 and draw as many conclusions and lessons that we can from our 2021 experiences. I'm Dave Meyer with Bigger Pockets, and thank you guys so much for being here. I'm always grateful for all of you, but as we wind down 2021, I just wanted to take one second to thank you guys for your support this year. You might know that I've only actually been making these YouTube videos for six or eight months now, and it's been a really great experience. I'm having a lot of fun doing it. I hope you all get a lot of value out of it, and I just wanted to say thank you. And if you do value and appreciate this content, please, Give us a thumbs up, we really appreciate it. It helps the YouTube algorithm favor our content and it helps us make more content just like this. With that, let's dive into the five biggest stories from 2021 and what we can expect going into 2022. All right, first thing, first, we are going to look at the median home price because this is the major headline, right? This is what you hear on the news, it's what people are talking about with their friends and their family at Thanksgiving or Christmas and I first want to show you a zoomed out view of the median sales price in the U.S. because this shows some historical context. Just look at this chart. You can see back to 1960, basically, we've been on a, a very steady increase in home prices in the U.S., with the exception being the Great Recession, which we saw a downward trend here. And then ever since then, things were going up on a steeper incline and starting to flatten out. But... Then the pandemic hit, and now we are seeing really an unprecedented period of housing growth. I'm going to go down here to some Redfin data next and show you what's going on in year-over-year -year terms. And what that means is basically I'm looking at October in 2021 compared to October 2020. That's what year-over-year -year means. And again, I want to point out that we are looking at seasonally adjusted data. And that's super important when you look at any data for the housing market because it's, uh, housing market data is seasonal. So you want to look at it on a seasonally adjusted basis. And looking back at 2021, we started at a period where appreciation was super high. That was about 13 or 12%. So that's what we saw in the beginning of the year, which at the time, if you remember, felt crazy, right? We, no one had seen this level of appreciation going back to 2013 because between 2014 and 2020, midway through 2020, we we're at this six, 7% appreciation rate, which is still great because inflation during that time was about two or 3%. So in real terms, you are actually seeing asset appreciation, asset values increase, which is great. And then it sort of started in the second half of 2020, right at this point right here, uh, things started to go crazy. But going into 2021, we thought crazy meant 13%. Uh, how wrong we were. Because then things in May peaked at 25% year over year. I, I haven't looked at the data all the way back in time, but I don't believe there is a single time in history we've seen 25% year over year data. And although it seems maybe that means in May, prices were appreciating faster than they were at other points over the last year, but that's not necessarily true. And there's something called the base effect going on here. Um, and I want to show you. And what that means is because, again, we're looking at year over year data, May 2021 over May 2020, we have to not just consider if prices went up in 2021. We have to look at were prices going down in May of 2020. And that is exactly what happened. So I'm going to go up here to it, which is the same as the first chart that we showed you. It's just zoomed in a little bit. Uh, in 2020, around May, 
we saw sort of the bottoming out of housing prices. And that's when we were in a, in a bit of a small recession um, due to the pandemic. And so when we compare year over year, we have to factor in that housing prices were artificially low last May. So that's probably why it peaked back then. Then um, when you go down here, once we start comparing our data again to uh, the second half of 2021, when things started to accelerate, remember, so now we are looking at September over September and September of 2020, if you remember, was really good. So things have come back down to this other level, which is about 13%. Again, this is really, really extreme appreciation, things that we haven't seen for seven or eight years. But I think it's important to note that home price appreciation is decelerating right now, which in my mind is a good thing. 25% year over year growth is just not sustainable. That is not a healthy housing market. And in fact, we probably want to get back down to the six, five, six, seven percent level in the next year or so uh, to have a balanced competitive housing market. But for now, we are seeing really high levels of appreciation. And that's the major headline of 2020 or on, right? If people are going to look back and remember, ask what happened in 2021, people are going to say the housing market went absolutely nuts. But we also have to ask, why did they go nuts? So those are the other indicators that we're going to look at. And as I said before, the second headline that we're going to look at from 2021 is interest rates. Now, this first chart, I'm going to show you two charts, same data. First one zoomed out, second one is zoomed in. So this first chart here is historical context for interest rates. Things have been on a downward trajectory since the mid, the early 80s, really. Uh, and that has really accelerated during the pandemic. So I'm going to move over here to our zoomed in chart and just show what has happened since 2012. So things fluctuated for years, uh, but things were always around 4%. Then in the beginning of 2021, so this is a 2020 recap, right? When we started this year, interest rates on a 30-year fixed rate mortgage were the lowest that they have ever been. And I've said on this channel many times, it's the lowest I think they will ever go. It's not guaranteed, but I would be very hard pressed to believe it's ever gonna go lower than that. But things started to rise in 2021 and people thought that this was gonna keep going up and bond yields were starting to rise. And there's all these factors that were showing us that interest rates were gonna go up. But that just didn't happen. Instead, interest rates kept going down. And there's a whole variety of reasons why this happened. There was a lot of economic uncertainty, the pandemic, uh, and things started to go back down. So at, you know, when we were sitting in the middle of 2021, interest rates, again, they were a little bit higher than they were at the beginning of the year, but they didn't move very much. And this is significant because low interest rates propel housing prices higher. I've said it before, but I think one of the things people really underestimate about the housing market is what a big impact low interest rates have on prices. When interest rates are low, it is cheaper to get a mortgage and people can afford more homes. So throughout this year, you know, we thought at the beginning of the year that housing price appreciation would come down because interest rates were going to rise, but that just didn't happen. In fact, they started to go back down again uh, throughout, you know, the middle of 2021. Now, since let's say July or August, we have seen that trend reverse again. And now we are seeing interest rates go up and I expect this one to continue. And that is because this round of uh, interest rates rising is driven primarily by inflation. Inflation is, you know, you know, probably know what it is, but inflation decreases the value of the dollar, it decreases your spending power. And the reason that interest rates are rising because of inflation is because the main way that the Fed fights inflation is by raising interest rates. When interest rates are really low, it increases monetary supply, which is basically stimulus, right? Asset prices go up, the economy goes crazy. But when interest rates start to rise, it, it has a cooling effect. And this could have a, a cooling effect on the stock market or the housing market, but it also has a cooling effect on inflation. So the Fed is trying to play this game. They want to see economic expansion, but they don't want inflation. And what they're probably going to do is raise rates slowly over the next couple of years. 
And actually for most of the year, they've been signaling that that first rate that they are going to, first time they're gonna raise rates will be in Q4 of 2022. But actually just last week, Jerome Powell, the director of the chairman of the Fed, uh, was testifying before the Senate and signaled that they might actually do that a little sooner. It is unclear, but for the first time, it seems that interest rates could go up before the end of 2022. And that's a significant story for real estate investors because that could really cool off the housing market faster than I, at least I previously expected. So the next thing that we're going to look at here is inventory and demand. And this has been a real major story point in the housing market and the real estate industry this year. So people keep saying there's no inventory. And I just want to talk about that for a minute because that is not exactly true. And there are a lot of ways to measure this. And so I'm going to go through a few of them. But when people say there aren't a lot of homes on the market, Sure, that is true in some respects, depending on how you measure it, but it's not exactly getting to the real point here. So the way I like to look at inventory or measure inventory is something called new listings. Again, we're looking at this seasonally adjusted basis. Um, and thank you to Redfin for all this great data. Um, and so what we're looking at here is how many new homes come on the market for sale. Um, and as you can see, seasonally adjusted, we are actually, this is where we're about pre-pandemic and you know what? We're right about the same spot. You know, things spiked in 2020, but we are right about where we would expect to be. So when people say there's nothing on the market, that's not really true. People are selling their homes. And I think the point here is that, and we can see that actually, let's look at this first. So the point here is that people are selling their homes. Now what we're doing is looking at home sales, again, seasonally adjusted, and you can see that home sales have actually gone up. So if no one was putting their home on the market, that would be pretty much impossible. So clearly people are putting their homes on the market. We're actually seeing really strong home sales numbers right now. So that is really encouraging for the health of the housing market because Home sales is a measure of demand, right? Housing prices have gone up, but people still want in on the US housing market despite these rising numbers. People are still uh, are buying like crazy. I mean, on a seasonally adjusted basis, home sales are actually going up right now. So even though prices are high, people are still wanting to get into this market. So I wanna get back to that idea about inventory. As I showed, when you have inventory, as measured by new listings, it's actually right on par where we would expect it to be, and it's right flat with pre-pandemic levels. But what is happening is that at any given point of time, like if you are going out to try and buy a home, there aren't very many houses on the market. And how does that square up? How are more people putting their house on the market, but there's less houses for you to actually buy? Well, that's because demand is so strong and markets are just super competitive. So the second people put something on the market, again, a lot of people put it on the market, but they get snapped up really quick. So all of a sudden, when you go out to buy a home, there's just not that much inventory for you to look at. And I think that's a key distinction because if people weren't selling their homes, that would be a bad sign for the housing market. But because people are listing their homes and they're getting bought, that shows strong demand, which is a good fundamental for the housing market. Now, in order to measure competitiveness, rather than looking at new listings, one of the things I like to look at is months of supply. And you could also look at days on market. These are both me good measures of competitiveness. But as you can see, with months of supply, the lower the number, the higher the competition. We are at very, very low uh, numbers, months of supply, which indicates really, really high <laughs> competition. And that doesn't look like it's changing. You know, I actually thought in the beginning of this year that we were gonna see things start to tick up. But as we look at 2021 and what we learned, competition has remained extremely high and that has remained flat over the course of the year. Now, I think as we go into next year, competition in the first half of the year is gonna remain high because as the Fed signals interest rates rising, a lot of people are probably gonna jump into the market to take advantage of low rates before they go up. Once rates start to come down, demand could come down 
And that could decrease competition in the market and make it easier to buy something. So that's a major story about another, the second major story about why housing prices have gone up. First one was interest rates. We thought they were going to rise in 2021. They haven't really risen. The second is that people are selling a lot of homes. Demand rates remains extremely strong and market competition is high. So it's a seller's market. That is definitely true, but that does not mean that the foundation and the fundamentals of the housing market are not strong. Let's move on to the fourth major headline of 2021, which is new construction. So when I talked about inventory and said that people were listing their homes and it's right on par with what we expect, that's true. But in a broader, more macro term, the U.S. just doesn't have enough houses. And I've said, we've done whole videos on this, but I just want to recap what's been going on here. So again, we're going to look at historical context and then zoom in. For historical context, this is number of new homes starting, new construction, basically. How many new homes are being built in the U.S.? And this has fluctuated wildly over the course of American history, at least back to 1960. And then we saw an absolute plummeting. You don't see data like this all the time where things just absolutely, this is the definition of falling off a cliff. Um, so things absolutely plummeted and have not recovered. A lot of what happened in the Great Recession is people were building speculatively and a lot of these home builders, construction, they went out of business or people went into new lines of work and it has been recovering ever since the Great Recession, but we are still at this level, right? We have been had construction, oops, that wasn't a great line, but we, uh, we've seen construction way higher than this in the history. And so there is an estimate, I've seen a bunch of different estimates that the US, I'm gonna write it here, is four to seven million homes short. Four to seven million homes short, think about that. Let's jump in here. Now we're at the point where we're building about 1.6 million homes per year. And I think I've said this before, but I've calculated that with rising demand and this home shortage, it is likely that it would take nine to 10 years for this gap to be filled if we continued at current, at current construction rates. But construction rates are actually starting to go down, right? So we saw, again, in the beginning of 2021, we saw this huge spike, right? A lot of people were enthusiastic because the vaccines were coming out. The economy was coming back. All oh, the stimulus was coming out. Construction went up. Then remember when lumber grew by like 500% in May? People got spooked. And so it crashed back down. Then they tried to get it back up again. But now it's on a downward trajectory. And that is because like a lot of other parts of the economy, things are expensive right now. Material costs are still really high. There's a very tight labor market. And so labor prices are going up. And this impacts home builders just like it impacts any other business out there. So construction is on a downward trend. And I think that's a super important thing because a lot of people in the housing market, in policy, in Americans want to see more houses built. The only way out of this, this, this shortage of housing supply is by building more houses. And unfortunately, we are not going to see a construction boom anytime soon that is gonna get us out of this. And to me, the big takeaway here going to 2022 is that the long-term prospects of the housing market are very, very strong. And listen, in the next couple of years, there could be a time when prices slide backwards. I don't know exactly when that is going to be. I've gone on record and said, I don't think that's gonna be in 2022, but in the years out from there, I'm not quite sure. But I think the point here is that over 10 years, over 15 years, the prospect of appreciation for the housing market remain extremely strong. And this just goes back to this, the basic tenets of supply and demand, right? We don't have enough supply. And when demand is steady or going up like it is, and supply is not keeping pace, that is when prices go up. So I think this is a super important thing in 2021 that we've seen, which is construction is just not going to meet the needs of the nation. And that's going to mean housing prices are going to keep going up. The last thing I want to talk about is affordability. And affordability is a really great thing to track because it takes into account a lot of factors. The major three factors it takes into account are prices, home, uh, so home values, like the median home price in the US, 
interest rates, and wage growth. It basically is a measurement of how much people can reasonably afford to spend on housing. And the reason I wanted to bring this into this video and talk about this is I think if there are any risks for the housing market in 2022 and beyond, it's affordability, right? Housing prices have grown so fast that they are outpacing wage growth. And the decline in interest rates have offset that a little bit. But I really think that when interest rates start to rise, it is going to have a negative impact on affordability and that can decrease demand. So let's just dig into the data here. So the first thing I did was overlay two data sets, which is the median price of a single family home. Again, this is the same data, um, not seasonally adjusted, just, um, just to call that out because our income data is not seasonally adjusted and I wanted to keep it consistent. So this is the blue line is the median price of a single family home. And the green line is the median family income in the US. Notice anything? One is going up really quickly. Yes, it went down here, but bam, it is going up like crazy. And meanwhile, the median family income is just trotting along. And yes, it's going up and it is going up pretty consistently, but not on this slope. You would need to see it go like, we would need to go like that, right? To make affordability stay the same. All things being equal and interest rates not changing. But Interest rates do have a really important play here because, again, when interest rates decline, we start to see affordability increase. Mortgages are cheaper. It's cheaper to buy a house. So NIR has this really cool thing called the Affordability Index, and I've plotted this out over the last few years to show you what's been going on. And this goes back to 1989, if you can't read these small numbers here. Sorry, those are small. And what we've seen is that you know, throughout the 90s, um, we've seen that this index lives in around the 130 to 140 range. When, when things started, things really started to decline leading up to the Great Recession, right? That's because housing prices were running up at that point. So this started to go down and then there was a crash. And when the market crashes, affordability goes up, right? right? Housing prices go down. And so that's when we saw this huge increase in affordability. Right. That I think the peak of affordability is probably in 2011. Yep, it is in 2011 because that's when interest rates really went down. In 2009, 2010, interest rates were still in the four and a half percent, but then they went really far down around here, which is probably the peak of affordability. That's when people really started believing that the housing market was coming back. And so housing prices really started to run up around 2013 and we saw affordability go down. Now, again, this is a 2021 recap, but I wanna provide some historical context. And so what we've seen over the last couple of years is actually housing in, uh, affordability actually went up during the pandemic. And I wanna remind you guys why. Prices have been going crazy, right? So affordability should go down? No, because interest rates went up, went down so low that affordability actually went up. Rates were so low, this is why demand started to go up, right? People were buying, people could buy more affordable homes. And so affordability has really gone up. And in 2021, it actually was going up because remember, like I showed you before, at the beginning of 2021 was the lowest mortgage rates have ever been. So we really saw good affordability, but now that rate, that prices continue to, to increase and interest rates are starting to inch up again, very slowly, but they're starting to inch up. We have seen affordability go back down. And now again, this isn't crashing. I know that that is a pretty dramatic decline, but again, we are at pre pandemic levels here. So it's not like crazy, but if this trajectory continues and we start to see affordability drop down here or here, that's when I think things could really start to get different and decrease demand in the housing market. So this is another thing I think is really important. We are seeing affordability decline in 2021. And if that continues into 2022 with rising interest rates, could be a major factor in home prices for the next few years. All right, that is it for our 2021 data recap. I hope this has helped you all make sense of everything that went on this past year and given you a couple things to look for and look forward to in 2022. 
I, for one, am really looking forward to making more videos just like this and helping you all make sense of the housing market and real estate investing in general. Thank you guys so much for joining me. As always, I'm Dave Meyer for Bigger Pockets, and I'll see you all next week.